Hey everybody, and welcome back to making a Python 3 NIST simulator from scratch. My name is Andy, and as always, we are going to begin by thinking about what we're going to do, because I have no idea. Uh, so looking at my last commit, it's been a while since I've streamed actually, so uh, 12 days ago actually, and at that point we finished all the NIST test CPU instructions. Uh, so what does that mean? It just means that we have finished all the instructions for the CPU and we have something that tests that that is working correctly and does what yeah what we expect so it looks like for now at least we've finished the CPU so we're going to be moving on to the PPU uh, the PPU is the picture processing unit I believe but it's basically the graphics card picture processing unit yeah of the uh, of the NAS um, and as we can see here, what does it do? It generates a composite video signal with 240 lines of pixels. So it has its own address space, which is something that we've modeled already when we're working with the CPU. And it's going to, excuse me while I adjust this, it's gonna be something that we're gonna to use to control the graphics, the graphics that we're gonna be drawing. Uh, so the way that we're gonna be drawing graphics is using something called, well, I think so. He's going to be using something called Piglet. So, actually, the Python graphics frameworks are typically pretty bad. Um, I kind of like Piglet. I really don't like Pygame. Um, I've used it a couple of times, and I'm not a huge, huge fan of it to be honest. But um, but Piglet seems quite nice. So it allows you to hook directly into um, OpenGL stuff and also load images and kind of do some nice stuff for you, which we probably don't need to do, but yeah, whatever. So, I'll pull up the documentation for this, and basically what we're going to be aiming to do today is implement something that can create a window, draw a background color, and the, the way I kind of understand that the PPU works is that it contains 10 kilobytes of memory, so it stores the shapes of background and sprite tiles, plus storing a map. So I think the way it works is it has the sprite table essentially which is just going to define what are the available sprites that you can draw and the colors that they're filled with and stuff like that. Um, and then basically it'll just say, hey, blit that sprite at a certain location. Um, so essentially what we're going to want to be able to do is have something that can draw a background color. It can store um, sprites, which is going to be a, you know, an image essentially or a collection of pixels that we're probably going to have to pull out of memory and, and generate, uh, as well as being able to blit those to the screen and, and drawing them. Uh, give me a second. Yeah, so, so we're going to have to read through some of this stuff, as you can see. This is on the Nest Wiki, which is something that we regularly use, but there's plenty of stuff here on what are the registers that we need to use, as well as, hey, everything on how it works, the memory map and rendering, overscan, God, all this kind of stuff. So so it's going to take us a while to get through this. Um, this is going to be the next big stage now that we're kind of, quote-unquote, finished with the CPU, for now at least. Um, the PPU has the 16 kilobyte address bait completely separate. Huh. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, so we're going to have to figure out how we can address this CPU, RAM, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, for the moment, I want to focus on getting Piglet running. So, I don't even know if Piglet can run using Python 3. So that's probably the first step, is going to be to see if Piglet can be run using Python 3. And uh, my understanding is that Piglet is on... Oops. God. It's on Python package in index, which means we should be able to pip install it. Just by doing a pip install piglet. Uh, now the question is, is it going to be able to run on Python 3? And the answer is yes. Okay, that's really cool. So let's work on our virtual environment, which is called Nest. For those of you that have never seen virtual environments before, uh, they're a really cool way to manage your dependencies on a project by project basis. So I might need the piglet uh, package installed in this one, but not in, the, in another project that I'm running. So 
by doing pip install piglet, it'll only install it in this current project that I'm working on. Cool, so we've now installed Piglet and now we're going to keep uh, keep going and the way that we're going to do that I think is I kind of want to keep the graphics component of it quite separate so that if we do decide we want to use something, some other library, we can kind of rip it out so and replace it with something else. So I'm going to just create a graphics directory um, and a file in here that is just going to be I don't know, normally I'd call this main or something, but we can call this file graphics as well, so it's graphics graphics. And we're going to have a start or something like this. But for now, we're going to read the Piglet documentation and see what they recommend doing. Running a Piglet application. Yep, import Piglet, and we create a window. Uh, we have some... Um, decorators that will say on draw. Now I believe that you can use a class to kind of do all this kind of stuff um, just to kind of compress it into one thing but potentially that could be wrong. Okay, so piglet class. Yeah. You can inherit from window, yeah. So I've used Piglet before and I kind of vaguely remember some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you can inherit from window and then you can call the on draw methods and stuff like this. Um, the Piglet docs recommend inheritance. Nice. So, let's see. Let's see if this works. So, we're going to have a piglet window. So, really, the reality is that we're just going to call this our own window. And it's going to be called the PPU window. PP, oh, jeez. PPU window. We're going to have to import piglet. Uh, we don't really care about any of this other stuff. And the width. Uh, so, how big does the PPU meant to render to? Is there a set size? Or is it... Generates a composite video signal with 240 lines of pixels. Huh. I mean, you have... Yeah, I have no idea. Anyway, let's make this window 240 by 240 now. So the reality is we probably render a pixel and then that gets interpolated to whatever screen size that we want. Um, but... For now, we're just going to make it do this. So we'll create a window that's going to be 240 by 240. Um, windows base window. What Here we go. With height, caption resizable, yada, yada, yada. Um, cool, all right. We can call for event handlers later. So let's see what happens when we open a PPU window. So now that we've created all this stuff, we kind of also want to create our, our graphics, right? So our window. PPU window. So this is what we're going to render to. Sorry about this. Just going to respond to that. Cool, so we don't need anything, and then the only thing that we're going to need to do is try hooking this into the event loop. So let's find out how to do that windowing. Mm -hmm. Context, full screen windows, size and position. Here we go. Subclass and window. You can add a vendor plan that it's simply on the class. We just want to clear. Cool. So you just got to do hello world window and then piglet.app.run. 
Now, I think that this is going to steal our event loop, unless I'm wrong. This uh, piglet app dot run, but let's let's find that out. So I think if we do this, um, piglet dot app dot run, then we're never going to get to this code down here. Yeah. So the event loop is is stolen by the uh, by piglet. Um, so. I believe the piglet event framework. We're going to have to figure out how to uh, how to not have that happen. Now the answer is there might not be a way to make that happen, and we may just have to overwrite the uh, the loop and uh, run our code from in there, which would suck. But that would be life. Keeping track of time. Just going to X. Oh, the application event loop. Yeah, that's what we want. Yep. So, an application event new that is tuned for this. We don't really want that. We want to customize it. Mm -hmm. Typical games and uh, applications are unlikely to require it. Fair enough. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we can manually Pygame and STL require the application to write their own event loop. Oh, we could use STL instead of Piglet. I don't know. I think this has Python binding bindings. Let's find out. Not STL, sorry, um simple fast media library that's what it was called I've used this before and this was quite good on um, C++ I'm unsure if it has bindings for Python okay Python Py SFML does it have native bindings I thought it Tutorials. Um, API reference. Because I know it supports various different languages, so. Or it used to. Maybe it's actually been split out into here. Hmm. Community? Yeah, okay. So it looks like SML no longer supports the other languages. Which programming languages? Yeah, okay, so we're going to have to use this Python bindings for SFML. Right. Alright, well, getting started. Let's see what the API for this looks like. This looks quite nice. The real question is, can I? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So instead of hiding the event loop library, I can do this. The real question is whether I can directly, you know, create sprites from memory and particularly just draw pixels to a screen, which which I would think that would be possible. So let's see. Tutorials. Graphics, rectangle. Yep, so we can draw shapes. Yeah, this is what we want. Alright, screw you, Piglet. Let's try and install a SFML. Download. Mac OS X. Official support is slated. Ooh. Right, okay. I need to have Scython and SFML 2.0 installed. Hmm. Hmm. That's, um... Uh, 
that's worrying. That page at the top, this version is 1.3, 1.4, we'll concentrate on fixing bugs, in addition we first, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did indeed, welcome back Danny. Uh, I'm glad that someone is around to uh, point out the obvious. Uh, right, do I really want to be compiling manually versus using Piglet? Don't know. Um, so potentially the, the answer is going to be to not hand off the event loop then for Piglet and to dispatch events manually. Um, developers are strongly discouraged from running Piglet's applications like this. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody Max. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it says don't do that. I suppose the other thing to do will be uh, to customize the event loop itself um, and there will be a callback in here where I can run my own code and then I can call back to my other code, which is a bit shit because it's tying it quite tightly to, um, to Piglet. So what I might do is put this my my loop code in a function and pass it in to the event loop uh, and then see see if that works so screw us for mail I'm back to piglet all right is there an API documentation for piglet API event event loop event loop nope is there a search? No, I'm crazy. All right, well, event loop. Let's see. So calling run begins the application event loop, which processes operating system events. Yep calls the window, updates the window, this kind of stuff. Applications can subclass it, customize certain methods, yep. You should not, in general, override run, right. So, don't override run, except maybe call it and then just run some code after it. Uh, discourage from overriding this method. Mm -hmm. Run estimated, least squares, what is a least squared method doing here? Jeez. Enter blocking. Idle. Yep. So is there a... Hmm. hmm. Register event app on window close on enter on exit. Okay. So probably the thing to do is going to be to override the run method, even though they recommend against it, and just call super and then do some behavior outside of it. Because uh, don't do what they tell you. Yep, uh, event loop events. You can listen for several events. The most useful, which I just saw, is on window close and on loop enter, on loop exit. Right, okay, so we want to override idle. Mm -hmm. Ah, this sucks. I really want full control of my event loop. Hmm. Really just want a good... Oh god, maybe I'm gonna have to use Pygame. Kill me. Ah, no, screw you, Pygame. All right, well, let's see what happens. Hmm. Event loop, uh, and I'm gonna do this as a custom. Yep, and we kinda wanna override run 
Don't override this method. Don't tell me what to do. All right. And all this is going to do is search for events, check for running, continue running. Ah, oh, right. If true, run. Run. So is this a loop function? Oh, okay. So it's actually the run function that loops it over. Ah, oh, and then every time we call idle. Okay, so we do wanna we do wanna override idle. Um, so what is the way to do that? Whoa, that was not the shortcut I wanted. That was also not the shortcut I run wanted. I have no idea what the shortcut for generate. Okay, so we wanna override idle. Yep, return super dot idle. And we want to So for the moment we're just gonna print out the word A and we're just gonna see that we can in fact call this. So piglet dot app dot event loop dot run. We actually only one. Yes, we actually just want to run our our own event loop. Event loop dot event. Right. Okay. So we want to get our uh, custom event loop. run yeah okay right so now if I do this the window is still created and we're running and we're printing a which is what we want okay perfect so now, what if in here, uh, I'm going to come back to this and just try and draw some uh, some text on the screen, because that would be pretty nice. Window, window dot set visible. This happens automatically. Uh, context we don't really care about at the moment. Caption, yeah, whatever, whatever. Here we go. So let's get a label that's going on. And we want to draw the label. So now every time through tick through the event loop, it should update the window and draw the window. Um, cool. Let's see if that actually happens. Hello world. Uh, let's just check that where actually doing stuff here, self.label.text uh, self.count self.count plus equals one okay. so we're also going to have to make it die when it's meant to die Yeah, so it's definitely not updating. Now that. Ba -ba. Piglet, why you gotta be like this? Do I need to pass this to the event loop handler or something? Nope, okay. This doesn't update ever. Uh, that's fun, isn't it? It's 
So we're only calling the onDraw method once. Huh. Uh, I hate Python and graphic programming. Run. The run function does not return until all active windows have been called. To have additional code run periodically, schedule functions on the clock, right? This is how we do it. I just want to know how to draw something. Doesn't seem to be working, does it? So on drawer is only called once. I pass it off to the piglet app run. Oh god. Ah, oh, the dreaded pie game. Tutorial. Someday someone will make a nice pie game tutorial. All right, fine. Every time I do this, I'm like, I've realized, does this help? Uh, piglet slides. Let me see. Uh, I set out determined not to use Pygame, and then I always come. Whoa! Okay, I have no idea. Okay, let's get back. Handling events. Can I scroll on this? Is this okay? It's a bit weird. Um, sure, sure, sure. And suspect his code is calling. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see if, if that works. So doing it instead of doing it using the class thing. Is that double divided by integer division? Is that what that is? Sounds pretty cool. Didn't know that. Let's import run. Cannot import name PP window, fair enough. Interesting. Does count not exist from the outer scope? Apparently not. 
Ага. Да. Е, окей. So I can't access things from outside the scope of this function. Although I access label. Do I seriously have to like global it or something? God, that's terrible. I don't really want to do that. Yeah, I get to find that this is probably resetting it or something. Hmm. Well, look, if this is what I can do to get Pygame going, I'll give this a shot at the same time. I really don't want it to control my event loop, it's the issue. Um, I've already done this. Please tell me that pip can be can install Pygame. Oh god. Yeah, okay. No such thing as HG, eh? Hey? Python, <laughs> yeah. Uh, brew install Mercurial. Apparently, I don't have that installed. This is why I hate Python's graphics programming. I feel like it's the worst part of Python. All right, well, there we go. We're installing Pygame from a Bitbucket repository because apparently no one's figured out how to turn it into a wheel, which is fun. There's a bug with their PyPy repository. Jesus. Pygame. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, this should work as well. Do, do, do. Fatal error. I probably need. Okay. Pygame, tell me how to install you. Learn. A newbie guide. Sure. It's a wrapper for SDL. Potentially, I will need to install. Install. Nice. Windows, Unix, OS X, binary packages. Seriously? Pygame was last updated in 2009. Oh, God. The answer is it looks like I might need SDL installed. Um, which will be fun. Let's see. Can I just brew install SDL? That's always the dream. Yeah, I'm going to need SDL2. OK. 
Okay, brew install STL. All right, that installed. Let's try reinstalling Pygame. Do, 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 do. Installing Pygame Python 3 on Yosemite. This seems like a very useful link. I'm always crushed by how difficult this is. Do, do, do. Uh, I believe I have that installed. I have Homebrew installed. Yep. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna need these things. Downloading STL image. Maybe my next project after this should be to make a Python's graphics framework that installs easily. That's the dream. Ba -ba -da -ba. Alright, well it's cloning, that's a good start. I guess while this is installing, uh, maybe the answer is going to be to look at... I kind of want to go back to... this for my Python and just see, even though it doesn't have official support, Six. I could try installing Pius for Mel as well, because that would be quite nice. All right, Pi game is done. So let's we've got that installed at least, but um, let's also try downloading and installing SFML. Yep, installed and as mentioned below. Do, 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 as mentioned below. You'll need SFML and Scython installed on your computer. Mm hmm. Well, I just downloaded something. So let's download the latest SFML. Windows, no, OS X, yes.
Well, let's hope that two point, it works with 2.3.2 and Scython. Do I need exactly Scython 0.1.9? Oh, well, let's find out. Documentation. Scython documentation. Installing Scython. Hopefully I can do it through pip. Pip install Scython. Sweet. Well, let's try it with newer versions. So let's just do pip install Scython. Oops. Um, and the newest version of uh, SFML. And if that um, if that works, that'll be really good. Of course, it might not. But read me. Um. SFML. Uh, learn. Tutorials. Installing. Nope. Xcode. Do I really need to use Xcode? No, oh, jeez. <sighs> we recommend using the frameworks. Copy the contents of frameworks to slash library slash frameworks. It depends on a few external libraries. Copy the contents of xlibs. All right. You got your boss. Sure. Uh, okay, so we want to copy the contents of frameworks to lib frameworks. Uh, go to folder. So I'm just going to do this off screen. Right, so there we go, copied them, and it also wants me to copy extension libs. There. Cool. So I've done this and I've done this. Uh, I don't really care about the uh, Xcode stuff because I don't really want to really use Xcode. Um, and what this is telling me, don't forget to have these versions installed. Um, look, let's see if we can do it with the new versions. So if this doesn't work, then we can obviously just um, use the correct versions. But for now, let's try using newer stuff and see if that works. Cloning, cloning, still cloning. Right, well, one day. I believe in you get at my internet connection. This is actually... Ridic. Alright, well, let's presume that this isn't going to work and let's start implementing Pi game because we are pessimists 
And I had a Par Game tutorial open before, but I do not appear to have it anymore. Yeah, this will do. Uh, library not found for LSML system. Is that not one of the ones that I copied across? Yeah, it should be. It's in there. That's from l-system.framework. Um, This is going to kill me slowly. I got to ask, because you seem like you know your stuff. <laughs> uh, do I? <laughs> Why would you have a program on a Mac? Uh, that's a, that's an interesting question. I program on a Mac because I really enjoy using a Mac, um, and because ninety five percent of the time, it it is very similar experience to programming on Linux. Um, there are well with the stuff that I do. Obviously, when you're doing more C plus plus stuff and linking in libraries and things like that, I tend to I have a virtual machine like an Ubuntu virtual machine, which I use, but, um, yeah, for Python programming and more the kind of stuff I do, 99% of the time, OS X is fine, and obviously uses, why not use Linux? Uh, well, I don't know, multiple reasons, I guess, but I like, I prefer the experience of OS X, the rest of it, some of the stuff is really nice, some of the stuff on Linux is not so nice. Uh, I have multiple platforms using OS X. Uh, I have a laptop that, that runs it, and dual booting Linux on that kind of sucks. So, yeah, I just have one consistent thing. I'm not, yeah. I, look, I run Ubuntu every now and then, but I prefer to run OS X unless it, it's screwing me over. Yeah, I don't use Xcode. Xcode is terrible. Um... Unfortunately, for things like this, it looks like I might have to use Xcode, <laughs> which means that that's just not going to happen. So let's try installing this as a lib. So copy the contents of this to slash user slash local slash lib. I mean, yeah, the reality is um, with brew, which is kind of like the package system for OS X, you basically get a very similar experience to the package manager, to your kind of your apps get, whatever you call that on Ubuntu. And the command line and everything is all the same. So I find that it's very rarely any, any different. Well, for me at least. Uh, copy to there, and then copy include to user local include cool all right well let's see if that works yeah um i find that uh, yeah i have weird monitor setups and stuff like that and i find i have way more issues with linux than i do with os x on on sound and on graphics drivers and, and stuff like that. It's getting better, but yeah. All right, Pygame. We've got Pygame installed, so let's just use Pygame. Bam. Isn't it always nice when it doesn't know what Pygame.net is? Jeez. Right, okay.
def run cool let's see if we can do this what text editor is that uh, this is PyCharm um, which is a JetBrains Python IDE which is fantastic and is cross cross uh, platform um, so it'll run on um, Ubuntu and stuff as well I am using a theme on this called Darkula I think it's called which is kind of very similar to your, your default um, I've got Sublime open here but you can kind of see if I write some Python code and save this to my desktop as hello.py so it kind of is a bit of a different color scheme but it kind of looks a bit like like Sublime cool couldn't open ball.bmp that seems around right let's just get rid of that fill it with black flip the display can you do that can we get a window yes we can all right well Pygame works uh, yeah, the driver support is nowhere as good as Windows. Yeah, I, I mean, Windows driver support never used to be that crazy good with sound and stuff like that. But I used Windows 10 recently in someone else's computer, and it was like installing from scratch was uh, like flawless. I was surprised. I didn't have to get any drivers, do anything for it. It all just worked out of the bucket. Uh, do not use this file. It is the result of a failed Scython compilation. <laughs> All right, pip uninstall Scython. Uh, yes, pip install Scython 0 0.19. Uh, where are you? JetBrains makes cool stuff. I work with C Sharp a bunch, and I couldn't survive without Ray Sharper. Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of the JetBrains stuff. Uh, hello, why me? Um, yeah, it's basically, I use this, I also use their, um, what's it called, their Java one, IntelliJ, which I find is fantastic, but I think PyCharm is super good because their um, community edition is basically all you need for doing Python development and is free and good, and you can use it for commercial stuff. Um, it basically just doesn't have Django support. But I do Django work, so I have the professional edition. But, I mean, the community edition is good enough for most things. Um, yeah, that's the other one that they make that's really cool. They're, um, they're, I really like their C IDE. I forget what it's called. Um, C line, that's the one. C line I thought was fantastic. I love using that. Can Python be executable? Hells yeah. Uh, yes, you can compile Python. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so there's things like PyTOXE, which are Python packages which allow you to compile to an exec a Windows executable, for instance. Um, so you can distribute that as an exe on Windows. On OS X and on Linux, there's kind of... Obviously, you're not making exes, but there's different things you can do um, with... I mean, obviously, they have Python installed, they can just run it, but... Yeah, I do believe there are equivalents on Linux and OS X which lay to a package it up into a distributable thing, which I presume is what you're asking. Uh, cool, installed Scython. Well, let's see if we can install Python S as well. I'm going to presume this is not going to work, so I'm going to start using Pygame. Um, yeah, cool. Size equals with height. This is a crazy way of doing this. I did not know that this was valid syntax. That's actually super cool. Sweet. Anyway, so we've got an event loop now in our graphics, which is what we want. Um, so really what we want is actually something that can run the CPU and do all this kind of stuff. So I kind of want to push this code. I want to have something here, which is going to run the graphics and then run the CPU and stuff like that. So let's create the PPU window. Um, and the re how we're going to do that is I'm going to have a window class 
and it's gonna call pygame.init, which can't be found for some reason. We're gonna have an update function, which is gonna do nothing, and we're gonna have a draw function, which is gonna do something. Uh, I kind of like having brackets around there to indicate that it's a tuple because otherwise uh, it kind of is confusing what's going on. So self dot width equals self dot size zero. Uh, how do we go? I uh, don't know what you meant. If a client wants a program that does calculations and stuff but don't have to download the Python, yeah, so it is possible to do it. Um, I haven't done it before on Windows, so definitely, uh, sorry, on OS X and stuff, but it would be possible because you can do it on, on Windows. Uh, did you eat at a meatball place within the two last weeks? I was in Melbourne not long ago and I saw someone who's dead set identical to you. Uh, I haven't eaten at a meatball place in the last two weeks. Unless maybe you and I have different definitions of what a meatball place is. But I could have been around a meatball place. I am in Melbourne, so it could have been me. If I okay for a bit, please don't finish the PPU while I'm gone. Uh, I think we're, what, like 40 minutes in, and I've just finished installing a graphics framework, so I don't think that's going to be a uh, going to be a problem. Um, there's that meatball place on, like, Flinders Lane in the city, but I don't know if that's the one you're talking about. They specialize in meatballs. No, probably not. Me then, self.black equals near Acme Fed Square. Yeah, sadly no. Uh, and let's initialize a screen. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Yeah, don't worry, I'll be around. I'll be chugging away. Cool, so this is our event loop. So really we want to chuck the updating code into there. So our event loop code happens in our update function and then our draw function is just going to call black probably shouldn't be an instance variable but you get the point. Cool, so now we can make a window. Sweet, um, and now I have a doppelganger going around. <laughs> Fair enough. How's the progress on the emulator going? Really well. So we finished doing doing the uh, CPU, um, and by finished doing the CPU, I mean we're running it through something called the nest test ROM, which is basically ten thousand instructions or something where it has like an expected you know, static state before and expected state afterwards, and we implemented all the known and unknown instructions, which adds up to around 230-ish instructions, roughly. I could tell you, actually, but... Um, yeah, so that was super, super cool. So now we're moving on to the PPU, which is going to be, hey, we need the ability to draw things, split things to a screen and start showing some graphics, and... Um, yeah, that's why I'm kind of like banging my head against the wall trying to install a uh, Python graphics framework. Because they suck. Alright, let's split this up into def update, def draw. Um, do, 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 do. And it's just going to call update draw. Right, so. This code is just going to be in here, that is CPU code. Yeah. No worries, I'm going to look for a bit. Good luck with the keyboard grind. Thank you very much. Thank you, I mean. And uh, yeah, stick around. If you have any questions, whatever, pipe up. I get the feeling that things are going to slow down for a while, because I have no idea what I'm doing. Not that I ever did, so, you know, <laughs> maybe not so much. All right, so let's do a nest class. And it's going to take in a PPU, CPU, RAM, all that kind of stuff. Do, so the CPU contains the RAM, the PPU, and the APU. But the thing is going to require CPU 
PPU, APU, RAM, window. There's no real reason to make this a class, but why not, you know? Uh, where am I at? You can compile a Python script to native machine code using various tools libraries. You can also, I believe, just compile to the Python bytecode, which then be run with the Python thing, or you can pass around the Python script. Yeah, yeah. So you can compile to uh, some lower thing on OS X and Linux, and on Python, uh, sorry, on Windows, you need to use something called PyTOXE, which does some really, like, I don't know, crazy things to turn it into an executable. And you can, like, uh, bake dependencies into that and stuff like that. So you can bake libraries into it. It has some weird things about multi-threading it struggles with. I've screwed around with it a bit before, but it's pretty good. Right. Um, so, def main loop. Let's just chuck this in here. And let's find out if we're testing. Right, so if we are testing, bam. Sure, and def the main loop. We've already opened this. Let's get our while true going on. Uh, and we really only want to be doing this if um, is not none. So, you know, this is slow, but because we're doing this if check every single time we run in the loop. But I don't really care about that for now. Cool, so we kind of load up everything here. I kind of want to do this startup code and all these kind of things um, in here. Uh, soft.cpu. Uh, what is this question? Is it possible to make a program or software that uses two or more programming languages? Yes, definitely. Um, making them talk to each other is the interesting part. Um, so, one thing that is quite common to do is you would have a web server, which is a, a program. So, for instance, running in Django, which is in Python. So it can accept messages in, you know, if you post data to a web page, for instance, and reply to that. And you might have another component that sits there and does something else. So a lot of the time you might have... Let me um, just pull up a, a thing here so I can kind of explain this, but... Sorry, I'm just going to plug this in. Uh, that's a real pen, not a that I can use to control this. All right, that didn't work. Get rid of that. I don't quite know what this window is doing so small. Yeah, all right, how do I zoom in? This is one of those times. Seriously? Yeah, okay. Cool. So, geez, I am struggling. So, a lot of the time, I have no idea what just happened there. All right. Or why this is so broken. Cool. A lot of the time you'll have 
a program over here. So this is an example of an architecture you might have, which might be running Python code or something. And you might have something over here that's running, you know, C code or Java code or whatever. And basically, the way the this might form a greater software system, um, where this all exists as running as one program, is that they'll run separately, but typically you communicate in between them using a, a message format. So something like JSON or, you know, there are other things, but JSON's a common one. So you might have a Python program over here that sits and, and you know, waits for responses, and you might have something over here that sits and does little chunks of work. So a common thing is you might have something that farms out work. So this Python code might be sitting here and getting them web requests. So when you tell it to run a job or something, it will say, instead of actually doing the work itself, it'll go tell, pass a message to this C component, which will run and do the job really fast. And then when it's done, it'll pass back a message and Python can report back. So you, you kind of have this architecture all over time where you have multiple things running and they kind of communicate by using a, a predefined message structure. But they are separate programs, but they kind of exist and work together to make one bigger software thing. But typically that's how you uh, communicate between different languages. If that makes sense. Hopefully it did. Self to ROM equals ROM. Nice. Right, so we want to create a NES. Um, and we want to pass in. Actually, the reality is we probably just want to pass in the ROM bytes. And then we just want to copy all of this. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a better way of doing it. So, ROM bytes, and are we testing? Which is args.test. So, um, thank you. There is also such thing as foreign language compilation, which many languages support. Uh, that is also true, but I have absolutely no experience doing that. So, unfortunately, I probably can't give you much info on that. You can write assembly in C, and you can in include C libraries in Fortran. That's true. Uh, I think it's typically easier when you have common ground. So, a lot of the... Um, so Java, for example, compiles to a kind of a lower level level language. Well, I don't know if compiles the right word, but it compiles to um, to JVM, which is JVM bytecode or whatever. So you can have other languages like Groovy and Scala and stuff. I think also compile to the same thing. So you can talk between Java code, Kotlin code, Groovy code, even though they're different programming languages, because they have the same thing that they compile to. That's fun. How's it? It's um, it's a good question. Do 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 rombats. All right. Typically, the answer is it's easier to do one thing. If that makes sense. Uh, sorry. Typically, it's best to have one language, but a lot of the time you will have on something if you're developing on something like Android. Um, everything's going to be. Uh, Java, but you know, in the background, running the Android, there's actually C code and there's other code and there's Scala and Groovy and heaps of other shit running. All right, ness dot load ness dot run. Cool. Def run. That's what we're calling it now. Uh, I really want to put a self in front of all of these. Uh, I don't want to start up the CPU or load the ROM. Self.window, self.testing. Nice.
identify um, yeah so really I can just just say if testing cool okay so this is going to simplify now we'll leave the file loading and argument parsing outside of it and now we have a nest object that's going to contain our CPU and our PPU window and all this kind of stuff uh, I take it by your name, you're mainly a Python programmer. I am mainly a Python programmer. Um, I do program in other languages, but I kind of, I love Python and it's what I've done the most work in. Do you prefer 2 or 3? Uh, I definitely prefer 3. So I've mainly been a Python 2 programmer. Um, and it's only really with this project and other ones that I kind of started at a similar time that I started looking into Python 3. Um, and basically the answer is it just gets rid of a lot of the stuff in Python 2 that was inconsistent. Uh, it, it it gets rid of, I don't know, if you've ever tried explaining, you know, Python to someone and how it works, but in Python 2 a lot of the time it's, yeah, this is how it works except for this one case or, you know, this edge case, whereas I feel like Python 3 has smoothed out a lot of that stuff. I mean, just even kind of simple stuff of you don't have to inherit from object, and if you forget that in Python 2, then you're using these old style classes. When you're calling super in Python 2, you have to have these keywords, which if you're doing anything dynamic and stuff, you have to know what your class name is. Python 3, it'll just figure it out for you. Looks a lot cleaner. Print being a function makes sense. There's less just yeah, stuff that seems like exceptions to the rule the only downside to it I suppose is there are still there might be some libraries that don't exist on Python 3 but to be honest nowadays there's hardly any that don't support Python 3 and with Python 3.5 there's some other really kind of cool stuff function annotations I would quite like optional function annotations so you can say that this is a of type bytes that you're passing in and so on and so forth um, enums are supported, you know, it's just a more well-rounded language. Get rid of Piglet. Uh, cool. So, run load. This is really update. So let's make this an update function, which is going to do these things, and then a draw function which is just going to call self.window dot dot drop I can't type and this is also going to call self.window dot update um, while true self dot update nice Uh, I really like Python 3 much better than Python 2. Coming from C Sharp, C++, I find their class definitions to be ugly, what with all the underscores. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, are Python updates happening often? Yelly monthly? Uh, great question. How often is Python updated? I suppose it depends what you mean by update. There are regular tiny updates, bug fixes and stuff that doesn't really affect you. And they do major versions, maybe two times a year or something. The white space really kills me. Give me back curly braces. Uh, I kind of agree with you there. I really like using curly braces. But it's kind of a, once you get used to the Python way of doing it, I find that it's not. Yeah, you get used to it. Or at least I find it fine. Uh, I've never really had problems with that. The only kind of way where it goes wrong is obviously you're kind of like, if this, if this, you know, if this, oh god, pass, and then trying to figure out, you know, which line this corresponds to, um, that can sometimes be a bit problematic and it's a bit easier with braces, I agree. And so typically the rule is with Python code, you try to not nest things where possible. So instead of, uh, you know, if valid, do this, you tend to do if not valid, return, you know, no, you know, return none and then do this. 
if that makes sense. So kind of reducing your indentation is a bit of a, uh, yeah, technique. I don't know what the correct term for that is, but you know what I mean. Uh, where are we? I hated white space languages at first, but I'm recently starting to quite like the idea. Yeah, you, you do you do get used to it, but it, it does have drawbacks. I like to have as little as possible in my code that isn't to do with my actual app, less clutter. Yep, I agree. I find Python code much more reasonable, than, readable, sorry, than um, C++. What is a NIT? Uh, it is the initialization method. Um, my first experience with Python, we're trying to, I'll come back to that question, sorry, hells yeah. Run a classmate script, but uses two space tabs. Oh God, well, no one should use two space tabs. That's all right, end of end of story. And it is a constructor, correct? Uh, the thing I like most about Python is you don't have to declare variable data type. Yeah, that is it is fantastic. I think it's fantastic for people that are learning. Um, you can now in the new Python optionally declare it if you want. I think as you go further into Python, you realize that declaring variable data types are often really helpful. Sometimes you don't need it, and sometimes it's really nice to but sometimes it is really nice to have it, particularly when you're trying to be more careful about the code you like. But I completely agree. I, I think that Python not having compulsory declarations is a fantastic thing. Uh, yeah, and it, th these underscores are, to kind of answer another question, these underscores are mainly used for, hmm, how do I say this, very built-in class-specific methods. Um, so init is the constructor, so it's what co is called when you build a new object. It kind of, uh, yeah, the syntax of it is a bit weird, but once you realize that these underscores are, are common, so if you say self.name, oh, class.name I guess, but anyway, so window.name for instance, you can see it's got the double underscore, so it's actually just properties and attributes of the, the class itself. So the init with underscores is just the constructor method of the class or of the object. If everyone used tabs, people could have their own with preferences. When will people learn Visual Studio? Yeah, um, that's true. I mean, I guess the you just I know that Ruby by convention I'm pretty sure uses two two space tabs, whereas Python uses four. Um, yeah, whereas that would kind of be solved by using tabs. The problem with tab indentation in Python is sometimes you can get, if you have multi-line statements and you want to align them according to pep8, you can't do that without spaces. So it can get a little bit weird, but it's a very specific thing. Uh, it isn't really a constructor, it's an initializer. That's a great point. I guess that's why it's called a init. Um, they do... <laughs> fulfill similar functions, I suppose, in my head, but I could be wrong. I don't know syntactically what's the difference. I mean, I suppose a cons an initializer is being called on the object once it has been created, so it exists and you're setting attributes on it, whereas a constructor might do something different in the life cycle. Sorry for asking lots of questions. How long have you been programming in Python? Uh, A while. Um, I don't know. At least, I don't know, seven years or something. Uh, just what is it in C++? Yeah, yeah. They are, they are different things, but I think they, to me they're kind of similar, but I'm probably wrong. In C++, it's just your class name here. Yeah, yeah. So that is a constructor in C++, whereas I suppose this is more of a... Um, Initializer, which is a Python concept, I believe, but I, they, they fulfill similar roles. You're basically, this code is run when your object is being created. The difference is, I suppose, in the initializer, you can declare variables in Python, whereas in C++, you declare variables in your header file, and a constructor is just going to give them values, which is, yeah, a bit different. All right, let's keep going then. I've completely forgotten what I was doing. I think that if statement was from just from me trying to explain something. 
Yeah, no problem. Helps you. You gotta gotta learn by asking questions. Nothing wrong with that. All right, so I think this should work now. Do we have a window? We do have a window. Does that window exist anymore? It does. Why is it getting? Yeah, overflow, overflow. Cool. So for some reason it's getting thrown to back, probably by these print things or something, but I don't really mind. You declare variables in your class and initialize them in your constructor. Yeah, yeah. So in Python, you declare and initialize variables in the initializer, which is this function in C++. You declare them elsewhere and only initialize them in your constructor. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I understand the appeal of C++ and C Sharp. I actually really like C Sharp, but there's a certain appeal. Once you start writing Python code, there's a, there's a beauty in the simplicity. Well, in the lack of code that you have to write, basically. All right. Plus, it looks really pretty. You know, look at all this purple and orange. What a color scheme. What do we want to do? We want to like draw something. Let's see if we can draw something. So SFML, that's dead. Let's go back to Pygame. Pygame draw rect. I think this is one of the things that I like more about Python is that you don't have to declare variable names, but I really enjoy it when I have to as well. <laughs> I think it, it's got positive and negatives. What up, Kappa Pride? Indeed. Ah, close that. My game dot draw. Yeah, and uh, I think the the separation of declaration and initialization is actually something I really like in in C. I would kind of like. I mean, you can do it in Python, but I would kind of like if you could say, "Hey, I have to declare a size variable for this." Um, in my constructor as opposed to it just coming from your initializer. And you kind of can do that. You can do like app property, def size. Oops. Right? Um, this says that you have to have a size variable, but, well, you know, this is the size variable, I suppose. So instead of doing it here, you could do it here, but I really dislike that syntax. I think it looks really ugly, so... Yeah, that's one drawback of Python, is that there's no way of really declaring your variables nicely. Mm, wrecked. Cool. Draws a thing. Search for examples. Alright. So, fill it with black. Pygame.draw.rect. B. What is B? Who makes variables like this? Alright. Uh, display surface, color, uh, size. Okay. So we kind of want to be drawing it to our screen. Color, we kind of want to be white. And X, Y, width, height. Let's just make it at 10, 10, go to 20, 20. Uh, do, 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 do. Personally, I think loosely typed variables hurt readability. It does sometimes. I think particularly with function with parameters, I find I really enjoy having uh, typed things, which is why when Python 3.5 did this optional static typing, I really enjoy that, and I tend to use that a lot on function parameters because I find that's where mostly you need type information. Well, for me at least, when I'm looking at parameters, it's kind of nice to know that, hey, number of bytes I'm going to be getting in is an int. Obviously, that's kind of implied, but for something like location being an int, otherwise you have to kind of increase your variable names or document it in here of what are your params coming in, you know, what type is location is an int. I think that really sucked. I think I, in other places I don't mind it being not static so much. Um... We have AXE, they have millions of libraries. Yeah, everyone likes Python. 
Switch chat can't be trusted, of course not. C++ master race. Look, I can respect C++. I just would prefer to use Python. Stream lags. Ah, uh, oops. Uh, hmm. I don't actually know why that would be. Shouldn't be too bad. I've only dropped 5% of frames, so... Try refreshing or something, and maybe that'd help. Pete Sarol. It's lagging. Well, 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 well. I don't know what I can do about that. 6.4% of frames dropped. 